Hello, I'm Paula Blair and this is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores aspects of cultural production and their relationships with politics, society and culture more broadly. In this episode, Andrew Shale and I have a trip to the movies with big thanks to my mum for the Odeon gift card and we went to see historical drama Mary Queen of Scots. For about the first eight minutes or so of the discussion, the sound quality isn't great. I've done what I can to remove disturbances and keep distortion to a minimum. Please bear with it, it's much clearer after that. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting on Patreon and engaging on social media. Stick with me at the end for details on how to do both. I hope you find this useful. perfect story for our times, something like that, yeah. and uh, I thought, oh, yeah, women in power being screwed over by every man in their lives, yeah, that's pretty perfect for these times. Yeah, it would seem to wear its, hey, this is all about now, on its sleeve, <laughs> including having a, he might be trans, he might be gay, he might be both. It doesn't really matter, yeah. The sense of denied sisterhood that the film yeah. subtly, but quite consistently ramped up along the way. It dangled the possibility of these two women just sorting out an agreement between the two countries mm. without all of their male counsel. It dangled that prospect in front of our little tiny faces and it snatched it across. It was one of those because it's historical and that's largely true. I had to stop myself and going, Ah, oh, come on, don't be marrying him now. You know, because <laughs> obviously she's going to because she yeah. has to. But, you know, you're thinking, Oh, if he just didn't make that decision, how different things could be. But of course, she, <laughs> no, no, it has to happen a certain way because that's the history. There was a little tiny thing at the end that said, Although it's based on real events, some parts of this have been fictionalised. They weren't utterly bound to do that, but there, I suppose there are a few things they had to have happen. Particularly if they're going to advertise it as having been based on a history book, which they did. Much as we really didn't want her to marry Darnley, or really didn't want Queen Elizabeth to feel that she had to emasculate herself in order to be a woman in power, these kind of had to happen, didn't they? But Margot Robbie, great job of just looking really harrowed yeah. by bare facts of her existence. It's an incredible transformation that you see her go through. Of course, I am now going to have to go and look up what evidence is there that Elizabeth I had smallpox. And lived most of her adult life with smallpox scars. And that's why she had the lead white makeup. Yeah. I have to say, the word that kept coming to mind throughout watching that was ethereal. It had an ethereal look to it. Like it was set in a world that was just a couple of degrees rotated from where our world is. One in which, when you get married, you do dancing during the ceremony, which is lots of men just very slowly walking in formation. Didn't that seem a bit weird? Just after Mary and Darnley got married, they had a large group of men quietly and slowly walking in formation and dance. It um, must have been some sort of rite, you know, some yeah. processional thing in the Scottish court, maybe? What would it be? Historical fiction that had that veneer of, we've researched this in so many areas, I'm quite um, willing to go, oh yeah, I'm sure that was a thing. But let's take another example that suggests that a lot of these very ethereal scenes weren't just, this is a historical thing. The meeting between Mary and Elizabeth in that what seemed to be steam laundry, where they were walking and through... And this these yeah. sheets. You think, how big is this place? Yeah. And they were clearly able to hear each other, even though they started off something like 30 sheets far from each other. They were both able to do the usual talking at completely normal volume. Even though they're miles away yeah. from each other. So. It was theatrical but cinematic at the same time in the yeah. way that was done. And there was loads of that combination of theatricality, really dynamic cinematography as well, like the little bit where um, Elizabeth was just walking from a building out into the grounds of the building. And it was done with a wide angle lens and a camera that started off tilted quite sharply downwards, and then as she walked out underneath the camera, then it tilted upwards and moved downwards to look at her she walked off in the distance, so it just had that edge of, it's always going to be really pretty, and it's always going to be dingy, just in the way camera can do it. The closing credits, I found myself in the closing credits going, this is a director who's decided to go, I'm just going to make this look really haunting, beautiful, and haunting, just by filming shadows on screens, or 
glass on semi-transparent surfaces. I'm just like filming loads and loads of that and then putting in a little bit of focus, layering it over each other in post-production. This is somebody who considered every single shot, and there's loads of that during the project of film. This is someone who considered every single shot to be something that needs to be really painted. And then of course at the same time it was a bunch of people who were always about three seconds away from killing each other. The sense of menace of it was quite arresting as well. That was a fine, fine piece of work. And the music, that was a really important part of it. I quite like Max Richter. And I think one of his things is rearranging well-known pieces of music. He's done a really big arrangement of Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. And I kept sensing there that he'd rearranged Zadok the Priest. Did you find that, that that music was a little bit familiar? Do you know what? I wasn't paying attention to the music okay. until the credits. I mean, I think that's the beauty of most soundtracks, is that they're helping you along. You're not noticing them. And I wasn't especially noticing it when the film was playing. That's one of the reasons why I like to watch the end credits, is because that's usually when I start to concentrate on what the music actually sounds yeah. like. David Tennant, proper... It's fearsome. Yeah, also. The eyes. He's got so much facial hair. I'd heard it described and it still shocked me how much facial hair there actually was. It's those really piercing, unblinking eyes. <laughs> the utter conviction. Simon Mayo described him as doing his best Ian Paisley and it scared me because it really was just like him. It's like a skinny, hairy Ian Paisley. We had to point out he was John Knox. Yeah, the yeah. John Knox, the head of the Church of Scotland. And so the most Presbyterian Oh no, no, Presbyterian has not been set up yet, but the most... It's on the way, and that's what it's going to yeah. be modelled on, most really. Calvinist but it's Calvinist. the incitement to hatred and violence from this yeah. man. It's just modelled in what Ian Paisley becomes in Northern Ireland in the 1960s and 70s. Hellfire and brimstone smite the blasphemers and the fornicators and the whores. The film was not at all friendly to Protestants. You'd think that it might go, hey, there's all this religious conflict going on, and everyone on both sides is at mm. fault. But no, it regarded Catholicism as just being really quite warm and friendly, and all about chanting in Latin. And Protestants are the meanies who've taken over Scotland in Mary's absence. And yeah, Protestants are definitely the ones with a really vile creed at the time, but I don't think that it was a kind of, well, everyone's just believes something harmless and we can all live together just fine. But Mary seems to announce quite early on in the film, she says, yeah, we have total religious freedom in my country. And also, while we're on that, you've seen the Blues Brothers, right? No, it's so, okay. Okay, right, because this is a classic line of the Blues Brothers where the Blues Brothers and their band, they rock up at this country and western bar and they pretend to be a band that they've booked. And they say to them, what kind of music do you have here? And the woman behind the bar goes, oh, we got both cans. We got country and western. That's what came to mind when Mary, quite early on, she's holding court for the first time, she says, everyone will be free to worship here, Catholic and Protestant. <laughs> like, that exhausts the list. That's the fullest extent of just tolerance at the time. Just people. Welcome to my world. <laughs> is that a Protestant atheist or a Catholic <laughs> atheist? Oh, it is. This Gosh, it's such a huge history, isn't it? There's not even a whisper of anything that could be going on in Ireland at the time. It compares itself implicitly to a lot of existing historical fiction about that period. And so I kept finding myself constantly going, all right, so that's that moment there, which I've seen represented in that film before. Oh, and they're taking it to slightly different angle on that moment. A lot of it was just, hey, here, Saoirse Ronan's Mary is just a much more confident and together person than Margot Robbie's Elizabeth is. They did make that quite big point when they had that final confrontation between the two. But Elizabeth says to Mary, all of these things which are great about you, the fact that you're both really brave and really confident and really beautiful and you're able to have kids, these are your downfall. And I don't think she meant they're flaws in you. What she meant was, in this context, Mary, they're going to have all those things. Yeah, they're going to lead you to ill things up. I've got an I'm a feminist but about Mary <laughs> Queen of Scots. <laughs> yeah. I'm a feminist but I think my favourite thing about that movie is Mary's earrings. I think that's one of the things that gave it that it's not quite happening in this universe. Yeah. Element to it. it was that people's costumes were quite otherworldly. contemporary in a lot of ways. I thought she was mildly punk. Yeah. 
One of the sets of earrings was multiple small hoops yeah. going up one side of loads one of ear. One, yeah, loads of those on one ear and then one long dangly thing on the other ear. Yeah. Her armour as well. Yeah. Seems to be made of onyx. Loads of tiny little onyx yeah. strips to make something that looks a bit like flexible chainmail, but which is also gorgeously shiny. There was a lot of that's a stunning costume and everyone else is wearing black going on there. The costuming, I think, was incredible and the set designs and everything. Really incredible design work has gone on there. So many acting powerhouses as well. I mean, is there any accent that Saoirse Ronan <laughs> cannot do? <laughs> the issue that we've already had a little chat about in yeah. advance of would Mary have had a Scottish accent? I don't think that that actually has arisen because her accent is slightly French. I think she's managed to pull off Yeah, this. I find that actually. It's a mixture. And it's more French when she's speaking in French to mm -hmm. her various maidservants. Mm -hmm. But I think that was quite a good stab at someone who'd been brought up by Scottish people in France. Yeah, I think so. I was just basing the chat we had earlier on reviews that I've been hearing. The only criticism I've heard was, why does she have a Scottish accent? Would she not have had a French accent? And actually hearing it in the film, her Scottish accent is fairly mild. She speaks fluidly between French and English quite often. Yeah, this is someone who's presumably either very good at speaking French anyway, Saoirse Ronan, not Mary Queen of Scots, Saoirse Ronan's either very good at speaking French anyway, or went on a kind of crash course mm -hmm. in advance of doing the film. Well, she's very good at accents, mm -hmm. and I think she works very hard with dialect coaches and everything. I mean, a lot of actors do, but there's very few that can really pull it off convincingly. I mean, she has played really convincing you know, a range of American and English accents before. It's not that often that she plays an Irish accented person. And even sometimes mm -hmm. she does I mean she's, I think she's from Dublin and I think she's played rural Irish accented characters before and Irish characters who are from the 50s so their accent's going to be a bit different and that sort of thing. The Scottish with the French inflection like that was just really impressive. Both of her parents are from Dublin but she was born in New York City. Oh yes, yes I've heard her talk about that actually um, but and then, then they moved back. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then raised in Dublin. Ah, but briefly lived in County Carlow, but yeah, mostly Dublin. And Margot Robbie, I haven't seen a huge amount that Margot Robbie's done because I think it's just she's been in films that I haven't been very interested in seeing. I know she's done The Wolf of Wall Street. I would like to see I, Tonya, but haven't got around to it yet. And but she's done Harley Quinn and... Um, Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad, that's it. She's done a lot of work like that, and then she's in Goodbye Christopher Robin. I haven't seen that either, you know, so I just haven't seen her in very much. But I just thought she was really impressive, as well as Elizabeth I. And we're also talking about another actress who was doing not her native accent, mm. because Margot Robbie is... Paired with Guy Pearce as well, so Australians playing these really key English figures. Yes. I was finding, because I had to give you a dig because you were trying to do spot the cast member quite early into the film and for talking you were code violating and I was not impressed with you. We had a really well behaved audience apart from you, <laughs> which is unacceptable, Sheila. Yeah, you did an Elsa on me. And I, Elsa. Like you just turned and you instantly froze me into a huge block of ice. It's dig because I blast. didn't want to have to talk to you and then therefore break the code myself to say, we'll do this later, there's too much of this, we'll be doing it for the whole mm. film. The thing was, I thought, that's someone who we're going to see for about five seconds and then we're not going to see him again. But he's in all. most of the film. But he's both always in yeah. most of the film. Martin yeah. Compson, who you were recognising from Line of Duty. Yeah. There was Ian Hart in there as well, who I'm very fond of. He was Lord Maitland, one of the conspirators. One of the Scots. Yeah. Yeah, he is, I th if I know who you're talking Yes. Yeah, yeah you'll know he's, him. Yeah, he he's in basically everything. He's one of those actors, he dissolves into the character that he's playing. So yeah. he's one of those faces where you think, gosh, he's familiar, <laughs> but I don't know why. Because he mm. becomes the yeah, character. Yeah. He's an amazing character actor. He was Quirrell in Harry Potter and the ah, Philosopher's right. Stone. And is now 54. That's one of the yeah. things as well, because I was watching it and going gosh I know that person's face but they're old in this mm. how did everybody just suddenly get old <laughs> and obviously it's makeup but yeah. it's just oh 
Yeah. The film's finishing message seemed to be, okay, we've all suffered horrendously, we two queens, mm. from the systems we've had to live in. However, what we've managed to bring about is a solution to the current problem mm. of these two rival monarchies, which is one of you's dying without an heir and another one, although she's being executed, is leaving an heir who mm-hmm. will become the monarch of a united kingdom, a united mm. island. As if that was all, not as if it was planned, but just as if that was something that would solve everyone's problems. The uniting of two kingdoms into one. Mm. Whereas it hardly put an end to conflict on the mainland. There's so much more coming. It ends in a, after all that, things were happily ever after. There's a tiny hint of that in the text that comes up on screen in silence. Yeah. At the end, if you know the history at all, there's so much more pain coming. Yeah. You know, there's the Battle of the Boyne, Cromwell, all that stuff's going to happen. Yeah, well, I hesitate to call it a civil war, but yeah, yeah, the thing we've been calling a civil that's war coming in sort of in. 60 years after this. Yeah, and that will be based on the idea of legitimacy of a Catholic mm. monarch. Then 40 or so years after that is Battle of the Boyne, James versus William, then stuff like Culloden, which we've been learning about a little bit in yes, Outlander. Yeah. It's, yeah, we've been learning about it in fiction. <laughs> well, we've, yeah, we're it's... watching the fiction, but then we're reading the actual history about it, the Jacobites. The, f- the, the film, just momentarily, in its opening few seconds, mm. really annoyed me. And it was because some of the opening text, mm. which of course was all slightly quickly in order to make it look a bit old. <laughs> old timey, <Yeah. laughs> Elizabethan. Yeah. The opening bit of text said Mary was born a Catholic. Mm. And no. No one is born of any religious designation whatsoever. That really got I to know, me. But Even it's... a monarch. People are then brought up in religion. It's almost born. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's just this is a different world i mean it's still how a lot of people mm. think in this world but i mean yeah it was definitely a context in which she was for all intents and purposes born with mm. a religion but still it's an important distinction to make and perhaps the film is itself implicitly making it by having so much of its attention concentrated on the birth of james who we just saw as a kid we saw him as a newborn we saw him as a young baby we saw him as a bad a two-year-old and then boom we see him in mm. a bit of a postscript as an adult and this is someone who never says anything at all he's spoken about a lot by mary in the future tense as this person who mm. she really wants to secure a safe future for this is somebody who is not as far as the film's concerned going to be brought up to do anything other than be himself mm. you know he's not going to be brought up in a certain religion whereas that's exactly what happened Perhaps the film was implicitly at the end going, what happened to our characters, who are all adults in the film, is what ought not to happen to the successive generations. We're a very spoilery type of discussion, but I was dreading what I knew was coming at the end because the film starts as it's going to end with Mary's impending execution and you never actually see the execution. It cuts to black before the Mm. axe comes down. I was dreading that because that's the thing that's always stayed with me from the history lessons on this period is that it took about three goes to get her head off. It was yeah. a really horrific death that she had. I'm just looking that up. Oh, it's just mm. that always stayed with me. I vaguely remember a dramatisation of it, of seeing it when I was a teenager and it was around the time that I was looking at this period in history. I can't remember anything about this film, who made it, who was in it or anything. Maybe I'm imagining it but I do vaguely remember the camera being she's obviously out of shot she's in the off screen space and the camera's at standing height and she's obviously kneeling down and that it's watching the executioner having to have several goes and really grunting because he can't get through her neck just even in her death her body is stubborn yeah apparently um for all intents and purposes it took two blows it was just a little bit of work left for a third blow to um, accomplish which will kill you. Terrific. Uh, also, the tiny details. The execution, as the film indicated, a good something like 20 years mm. had elapsed between Mary coming to England and yeah, her Yeah, they kept executed. a prisoner for a long time. They indicated that ageing in everyone except for Mary. Yeah, they didn't she... age. They didn't make Saoirse Ronan age at all. Yeah. She was just herself. So she still had all of her hair and it was mm. still long and thick and lustrous as it had been throughout. In reality, when she was beheaded, she was wearing a wig mm. and it came off and it was revealed that she had very short grey hair mm-hmm. at the time. Everyone had gone through the deterioration that mm-hmm. we only see Elizabeth go through. Yeah. In this. Yeah, this is a lengthy account of her execution I'm reading here. 
But I suppose then it's the artistic license of imagining her end as she lived. You know, mm. so this young, powerful, confident, beautiful, intelligent queen. Maybe it's the impression of her as she was rather than this existence that she'd had for nearly 20 years. The problem that dogs historical fiction is giving a clear sense of how much time has elapsed between scenes. They give quite a good sense of Mary's been living in effective imprisonment in England for decades between this scene and that scene. But that was about it for indicating the passing of time. How much time had passed between earlier pairs of scenes. It was really unclear. The fact of her getting more and more pregnant, that gave a bit of a sense of scale mm. at one point. How old James the baby was yeah. at certain moments, that again gave it a sense of scale. Mm-hmm. But we should always expect when we look in the, the actual timelines of these things to go, oh, actually that thing that they suggested took about a month was actually mm. seven years. And this happened with the Outlaw King when we mm-hmm. watched that a couple of weeks yeah. back. There was lots of, oh, and then nothing happened for <laughs> six mm-hmm. years. Compression, I suppose, is part of the... Yeah, game. they have to. Whereas we would age and in seven years somebody's appearance can change quite a bit. Even if it's just their hair colour, if they've naturally started to go grey or something or more wrinkles have started to come in your face. And especially back then when people, you know, life was hard and it aged you quickly. Without those kinds of markers, it's difficult, I think. I maybe want a bit of a nerd for this, but I'd be quite happy if every single scene started with a statement of the day. So, you know, day, month, year, I'd be fine with that. It would annoy the pants off other people. I think I would appreciate it as well. Because I think that's where, maybe it's because I was so used to the X-Files. They would always update you and what date it was and Mm -hmm. what time it was and things. But it helped you get a sense of when things were happening and how much time had elapsed. So you Mm -hmm. could work stuff like that out. Because, yeah, with historic fiction, I mean, this was covering um, a 25-year period it clips along at quite a good pace, the film, and there are some really huge ellipses of time, but it doesn't feel like it. So things mm. that, as you say, feel like, well, this is all a couple of weeks worth of stuff. It's actually quite a few years, but none of the characters are really changing very much. There was very little sense that Mary had a secure hold on a big kingdom. And there's several reasons for this. The first was that we were constantly being shown men conspiring against each other mm-hmm. and against her. It was unrest after unrest after mm. unrest amongst her own council. Usually managing mm. to out-idiot each other. Yeah. yeah. And the moment when David Rizzio, the moment when he's killed, mm. clearly immediately after that, it seems that a plot has been put in place to make her a puppet monarch. Mm-hmm. So it's actually other men ruling, and she manages to get out of that by going to Bothwell, who's a loyal military leader. But then he later on turns against her, thinking that he's been given a promise of a crown. So everyone's out for screwing everyone else over. But another thing that gave a sense that she wasn't in charge of a secure kingdom was that she didn't appear to be in charge of a place that was populated because it's shot after shot by after five shot. people yeah. in Scotland <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just shot after shot after a couple shot of, of farmers of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and that guy who was doing fishing so many gorgeous shots of mm. the Highlands Holyrood is shown as this castle mm-hmm. against some mountains yeah. whereas it's next to a city I know. at this point and, you know a medieval city but still but a city but a populated yeah. city yeah. nonetheless yeah. and yet Carlisle when we were shown Carlisle we were just shown a ruined, a ruined castle, castle. Yeah, that yeah. Was, yeah, there's no people that's brilliant yeah. so this is an environment where there are seemingly only a handful of people and of course that's part of it this environment is very different from mm. England it's really mountainous it's rugged it's always raining there's mist everywhere but we did get a slight sense of this thing being popular with all of the shots of the interior of John Knox's church when he, mm-hmm. which is, he's, pre- he's preaching to this and people crowd. in their droves inside and outside of the church made the point in the cinematography of framing people hanging at the windows looking in hanging on his every word and then chanting death to the her death to the her um, scary stuff so what it seemed to indicate was there's this set of ghosts who come and go and might do what Mary wants them to there's a bunch of people in this church who just hate her. Mm. And then apart from that, maybe now and then some other Scots might emerge out of the ground, engage in a battle and then go back into the ground again. It well, was I... a really weird sense of her territory. This yeah. Time. I mean, I suppose so much of the drama is centred around these two queens and everything that's going on immediately in proximity to them politically, mm. that there's not really time and space for a lot more. 
any historical film is going to meet criticism so of, well, why wasn't such and such covered and this and this and this? And then you've got a list that couldn't even be covered by a lengthy television series. You just have to be selective about what you can show. And I think this film is more about the development of Mary and Elizabeth's characters and what was going on around them. And this examination of women who are in power, but they really haven't got any power or control. When we're having that scene of Mary in labour, which is intercut with the scene of Elizabeth making these little mm. roses, so that we could then have this graphic match yeah, between Elizabeth sitting, with, shots, her, uh-huh. sitting uh-huh. with her legs open and this huge carpet of these fabric or paper roses that yeah. she's been making, graphically matched to Mary sitting on a bunch of white blankets. With um, bloodstained sheets, yeah. yeah. Surrounded by her ladies in waiting there was moments in that where I thought hang on a minute did that edit there just show that they've somehow got Elizabeth there during the birth of yeah I wondered that because there was a moment that looked like she was yeah. Handling the baby, yeah. And of course it was in part done just through directional continuity. Yeah, um, yeah. Of having a character look into off-screen space right, and then in the next shot another character looks into off-screen yeah. space left. It looked like an island. It map. was just that parallel, And yeah. we were getting the two of them exchanging letters. Mm-hmm. Letters which clearly they exchanged afterwards, but the voiceovers were read over these parallel mm-hmm. scenes. I mean, clearly we've been cinemaed, mm-hmm. haven't we? We've been exactly put mm-hmm. where that scene wanted us to be. We're describing many ways in which this film was a, not just a finely crafted piece of cinema, but a finely crafted experience. There was quite a few moments. You know the sixth laugh test? I have the itchy bum test. It's if you become aware of how uncomfortable your seat is, ah. and so that you start moving around, yeah. so that the person next to you goes, "What's wrong? Have you got an itchy bum?" Yeah. Right? No, well, it's not. I wouldn't you, say itchy bum. It's the ants in your pants. <laughs> Then, if you become aware of how uncomfortable your seat is, then the film isn't quite doing enough to immerse you in Depends. story space. So I've been in really uncomfortable cinemas before, <laughs> and it doesn't matter how engaging the film is. If you're in pain, you're in pain. The thing was, you may have been sitting there going, why is he fidgeting so much? I just, yeah. so you're just a fidgeter, yeah, and you see it. fidgeting. There was moments in that film where I found myself just forgetting that I was in an auditorium. Yeah. I didn't think I was in 1570s mm. Scotland, but I did find myself completely oblivious to my immediate surroundings. Yeah. It was that immersive. I just was also fidgeting as well because I'm a fidgety. Person. It wasn't a terribly well attended screening, but it's been out for well, it's only been out well, what a week or two or something. But it's a big multiplex that we were at, and people are probably going to see other things. Aquaman. Aquaman. Yeah. yeah. This is something I'm curious about. If yours is the only cinema in town, and it's the last screening on a Saturday, and your screen is five, six empty, something's wrong. But there's something about a multi-screen yeah. cinema that means that they can quite happily, every screening, be showing to a, a mostly mm-hmm. empty room and still be doing just fine. Well, they charge enough. It's shocking um, how much it costs. But we went because my mum got me a birthday Odeon gift card, so that was why we were at the Odeon. Well, I was just going to say it was a well-behaved audience, nonetheless. Including the guy who had a massive thing of nachos. He, he wasn't was that bad. Like a beep. It was like he was going, yeah. I've got loud food and I'm now going to engage my doing it quietly yeah. mode. So he put himself into nacho stealth mode. Really dipped those nachos so they became <laughs> really soggy so there wasn't any crunch. And I was totally immersed. Nobody really distracted me at any point. There was a moment when I think somebody further along the same row as us, I think they maybe just moved their legs or something. And I thought there was a light from a phone. But all it was was they have really bright lights for the row ladder. That got me as well, actually. Yeah, Yeah, because I saw you look round. And then the light wasn't going away. So I had a quick glance and realised, oh, it's not a phone. It's just the seating lights and you put the pin back in the grenade because <laughs> that's how angry we get isn't it if we think well, someone's on their phone in a cinema we both go excuse me it wasn't really anger it was just more this has been a while they couldn't still be looking at the time or doing messages and I think because there was no movement there was more curiosity and then I realised oh mm. it's just somebody's moved their leg and revealed this light that's yeah. all it is and there was that and then right in the very end Mary's just about to be executed there's a breath that she does a very sharp intake of breath that makes a noise and it cuts to black quite suddenly and somebody tutted somewhere and that really annoyed me the touch <laughs> really annoyed me because it's pointless 
this might sound really silly, I find tutting, especially if it's at a thing, you know, like at a film or something, I find it mildly violent. It's just sonic violence that there's no need for. It's a sound of disapproval and when it's something like that in an open space that's dead silent because there was no music at this point, there was complete silence in the auditorium and nobody moved, nobody said anything. It was quite a poignant moment and somebody tutted in the middle of that and broke it. That bothered me. Pin out back out of the grenade. <laughs> There's an archetypal moment for when a film might make you go, Pah! and it's the end of Inception, isn't it? <laughs> Where it goes, and you're going to find out whether he's... No, you're not. It's Screw you guys. Just more like... Oh. Go home, yeah. You know, yeah. exhales. Or whatever. But this was just, why would you even touch that? Were yeah. you hoping to see the carnage of her execution? Just mm. such a needless noise. It's borderline involuntary for some people. Like groaning. Mm. Is. And it's sometimes, if you just really inhaled and held your breath for a while, and it's a really tense moment, when you let that breath out, you groan it out. Yeah. It's, it's going to be. I a... don't know. I think maybe I, I just associate the sound of it with impatience or displeasure yeah. or something. You know, it's quite a negative rather a, than a breaking of tension. It's a plosive expression of exasperation. I'm, I'm fed up with this yeah. sort of thing. It's also um, the form of sexual harassment in some countries. As well. Is it? Yeah. If you do it to someone, oh gosh, it's the mildest form. Oh of, my goodness! Um, I had no idea. Getting in somebody's personal space. I suppose it's worth saying that it was quite difficult to choose what to see because we're not going to the cinema very often at the moment. We hadn't been since well before Christmas. Was our last cinema trip Bohemian Rhapsody or had we seen something since then? We've been such Netflixy. Yeah, we've been little puppies. We've been in a lot, I think, because money's been a bit tighter lately and we haven't been going out so much. So I've had the voucher for a while now. It was time to use it. In the end, it was between Mary Queen of Scots and Stan, and, Stan Ollie. and Ollie, which we're still dying to see at some point. But there's a lot of really good stuff out at the moment, I think. I really plumped for um, Mary Queen of Scots because I feel like I've seen more than enough men's histories and I think Laurel and Hardy are really deserving of getting their stories told because I think they've been very undervalued yeah. by scholarship, by history, by just film culture in general. I don't think they're taken terribly seriously. It's in part because of the influence of cartoon versions. Yes. Of their films when yeah. I was a kid. That yeah. took it into an area of utterly undervalued I remember those, cultural yeah. work. And that yeah. respectively rubbed off on me originally. Do we know anything about the director? I'm not familiar with the name. Josie Rourke. But, okay, Josie yeah. Rourke. This was her first film. Really? She is a long-standing theatre director. Right, so that explains yeah, a lot of the theatrical <laughs> designs yeah. in there. Yeah. Okay. The choreographed action scenes, mm -hmm. the elaborate costumes, the not necessarily naturalistic backdrops mm. where we're supposed to imagine the world. Yeah, all mm. the face-offs between characters. She has directed upwards of 40 plays. Wow. So someone who you can understand working title taking a punt on somebody with that much experience in this cognate mm -hmm. cultural realm in spite of her not having directed a feature film before. She's got a huge theatrography, I think would be the... Mm. <laughs> not playography. Stageography? I'm going with theatrography. I've used that in a book recently, so it would better be a word. <laughs> Yeah, because it's yeah. not quite scenography, that's something a bit different. Oodles of Shakespeare. It's done loads of Shakespeare, of course, as you'd imagine. Recruiting officer, a bit of George Farquhar. Loads of Shakespeare. Vagina monologues. So she's done really prolifically since 2000. And one mm. of the things that you'd be forgiven for expecting from an established theatre director mm. is that this is a person who's going to rely on the movement of characters mm -hmm. and who's going to have lengthy takes with very few edits. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a camera that might be moving. but It was a very yeah. mobile camera. I noticed there was a lot of it rising early on. 
It would be over head height and it would rise yeah. quite powerfully. So maybe that's an influence of her considering the variety of different viewpoints you get of any stage. But what I was saying was, you know, you might expect somebody to just have a few edits within a scene, but keeping the edits to this scene's over now, here's a new one. But no, this was a really high editing rate film. This was a camera that was instantly translocating itself mm. from one place to another. This is someone who was using editing really determinedly. And I suppose when you've got a bunch of other people working under you, even if you might come to a film going, I'm going to have six edits in my film, I can do a Hitchcock. What's instantly going to happen is other people are going to go, right, here's a cool idea. Here's an interesting way of shooting this. It may have been Josie Rock. It may have been absolutely the influence of other people. It's worth finding out, I think. I'm going to look up interviews. Well, I was thinking with a lot of the high angle shots, especially from Mary, there's so many mentions of the divine hand over everything, that mm -hmm. it's God's will that she rules and whatever outcome there'll be is God's will. And so I was thinking maybe uh, there's a hint of that overseeing yeah. from above. It's also becoming increasingly standard to explore what stuff looks like from the viewpoint of a drone these days, isn't it? When you've yeah. got access to this new sort of way of moving a camera around in your well, set. if it can show the expanse, I mean, there was a really incredible shot with... Elizabeth on the roof of her palace. She's framed alone, you know, it pulls back, right back away from her. So it starts off level with her and it pulls right back and up and up and up and it's looking down on her in the palace. And she becomes this tiny engulfed figure, the most powerful person in the land. And she's this tiny speck of the black dress that she's wearing. She's mm. this fairly recognisable object in the distance, engulfed by this huge palace underneath her. There were plenty of extreme long shots of very small numbers of people mm. moving against huge, uncaring backdrops. That shot in particular, that came just after she's arranged with your man Guy Pearce, I think. I can't remember his character's name. They're trying to figure out what to do in the first instance, and it's before the attempted insurrection, which Mary very capably thwarts and wins the battle. It's the lead up to that and Elizabeth has basically relinquished all control. She says, I don't want to know anything about it. She doesn't mm. want to know about any bloodshed or violence or anything. And she seems then to, after that moment, she recoils into herself, into this very internal self-serving world of creating these portraits that she doesn't like and then orders them to be burned. Mm. You know, these beautiful creations that she's made. Hours upon hours of not just her labour, but the labour of her handmaidens who are helping her endlessly curl all this paper for these poppies that she's doing and these pictures yeah. that she's making and to just not be happy entirely with the colours and to just have them destroyed. There is something very introspective but destructive being reflected about her character in those and that shot before you see all of that starting to happen just really shows her as quite puny you know yeah, yeah. it was interesting hearing Sir Ronan and Margot Robbie being interviewed by Simon Mayo because they talked quite a bit about the one scene that they're in together obviously it's Mary's film but Elizabeth is very close second in this and it is a film of two halves they're two halves that are intercut with each other and interwoven but these are women who are separated so much of the time and they just have this one meeting they talked quite a bit about that meeting the production actually was all the Saoirse Ronan stuff was filmed first in a block and then they filmed that meeting and it's basically like passing on the baton yeah. she's done her bit, she's finished and she's passing it on to Margot Robbie she's going to carry it through that's the only time when they met on set, so Saoirse Ronan had been Mary Queen of Scots for months and then that was her last day of filming but it was Margot Robbie's first day of filming they weren't revealed to each other. That was them meeting for the first time as those characters even. They didn't see each other beforehand. And this was the scene where they're in this building with all these sheets hanging. So they're obscured from each other's view. They said they didn't mean to be so emotional, but just when they saw each other, it was so powerful that tears just came out of them. At one point I found myself going, what's happening with Margot Robbie's face? Mm. 
Mm. And of course, that's what tears look like when you've got this thick, yeah. greasy gook on your face. Yeah. Is they slide down it and they collect on uh -huh. the underside of your chin, like a little beard of tears. And they hang there and then occasionally mm. dribble off. It was a visceral scene. It was, one. yeah, it was really mm. powerful. So I think yeah. that's probably why it was kept, because it just was so affecting. And it made mm. them both human. Depictions of Elizabeth I make her so hard and cold and distant and unemotional and to see her humanised and to see her with emotion, knowing that everything Mary says is true but realising that she has the upper hand, yeah. working through all that emotion, this lost sisterhood but also the indignation that this person would threaten her in such a way, threaten her crime because according to the Stuart line Mary probably has more of a rightful claim to the throne at this point than Elizabeth and Elizabeth was considered by many to be illegitimate because her father had annulled the marriage and then had her mother killed and that comes up in the film actually when Mary's counsel is trying to encourage her to divorce her aged of a husband because he's a drunkard he's called by his own father a sodomite he's clearly gay I mean possibly bisexual I think sexuality is very fluid I mean it mm. was fluid at that time but he's very fluid but yet looked down upon because of his status in life and he seems to enjoy being with men a lot more than he does with women. It's really interesting like the sexuality in the film you know Mary's first encounter with him shall we say is interesting because you think at first so he's being very you see later that's probably part of his con but also he's just not into women. He goes down on her and he doesn't want her to do anything with him. Yeah. You see her getting pleasure from this. You think, oh, this is interesting. But then on their wedding night, he ends up in bed with David Rizzio, who is one of the Queen's troop, really. Yeah, her... And the ladies' maid. Yeah, he's practically one of them. Mary has to still deal with him and she refuses to divorce him because it's not right according to Catholicism and she doesn't want her son to be illegitimate. She wants to maintain the integrity of the marriage. But how she becomes pregnant, it's such a difficult scene. Like it was a very brave scene to do where she summons him and he's drunk and yeah, it just becomes really aggressive on both sides, I think. She's starting to do things to him that he doesn't consent to and riles him up. To the point where he then very forcefully does his business and, <laughs> she, and <she laughs> takes her from behind. And she looks like she's in an incredible pain, but she seems to know that it's going to make her pregnant and that's what she needs. So she's very happy yeah. about this. And so it's basically like a rape scene. It becomes him exerting power over her because he feels powerless. So he exerts power over her. And then she's very painfully getting what she wants and needs which is impregnated so that she has an heir. Yeah, so it's informed consent, but it's yeah. not enthusiastic. It's not consent. enthusiastic, <laughs> it's duty. It's yeah. for a higher purpose that she does it. It's calculated informed yeah. consent. I just wanted to point out, when we're on the subject of things that were quite real, there's that bit during the battle when mm. Bothwell goes to kill Moray. This is Bothwell played by Martin Compton and Moray's played by James McArdle. He goes to kill him and then Mary waves to her trumpeter to sound a recall so that if he hears that, he's not going to kill him. Won't. In like one of those shots where Martin Compton is on a horse and he's charging towards James McArdle, there was just a moment when Martin Compton lurched forward. Yeah. It looked like he was going to fall off the horse. Yeah. And then he got back up again. Yeah. I think that was one of those, it's actually the actor actually on a horse, yeah. actually doing all this stuff yeah, with a yeah. really light prop sword in his hand, but still it's you know, quite dangerous to situation. And it was serviceable. It they seemed thought, like a genuine recovery yeah. and it looked real. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll check the footage. Yeah, fine, he looks like he nearly falls off his horse for a moment, but you're in a battle. And, That's going to happen. That might happen to Bothwell. We'll keep that on we crack. Yeah, yeah. There was a roughness 
to it. Uh -huh. it did seem, I, mean, I get the impression there wasn't a lot of takes. It's mm. one or two takes on everything. You know, I'm getting yeah. that sense that whether it was budget, maybe a lot of the budget went on costume set design at paying the actors yeah. for all we know. And I mean, they must have all had to do so much training with horse riding because a lot of the actors really are horse riding a lot of the time. I kept looking for how are they doing that so that X doesn't have to learn to ride a horse and they're not. So she's running definitely She's is definitely riding a horse on a horse. Point. Everyone seems to be riding a horse. I think David Tennant was the only one who didn't get the opportunity <laughs> to do a bit of horse riding. He got to wear a hat though. <laughs> and he wore the crap out of that hat. His mm. eyes are proper scary in it. The unblinkingness of him. This is why I need to learn a little bit more about mm. various formations of various sects of Christianity. John Knox founded the Presbyterian Church of mm -hmm. Scotland. So there he was go. Presbyterian in the sense of originating it other than being yeah. a member of it. That's what I was saying. Like he's the model for Ian Paisley and what he would become. Recording pretty late at night and the discussion fizzled out a bit there. A few other observations just before wrapping up. I really appreciated that the cast wasn't whitewashed and the film acknowledged that people with anything other than white skin were in a minority rather than absent altogether in Elizabethan England and Scotland. I also appreciated it showing Mary menstruating to demonstrate her fertility. It's quite rare to see menstruation on screen and it be treated in the way that it was. I think it would be worth considering the film and discussions of British heritage cinema. This is probably a topic that should have come up more explicitly probably in previous episodes that are relevant along these lines so maybe that's something we'll try and edge into a bit more later on if this comes up again. The film seems largely to take a neutral or objective stance or at least tries to but it does I think tip over into privileging Mary's story. She's a sympathetic character here in how she's betrayed but to an extent so is Elizabeth. And I think the actresses played their characters with probably a lot more emotional intensity than even they thought they would, judging by what they've said in interviews. Along with films like Outlaw King, which you can see on Netflix, that's about Robert the Bruce, and The Favourite, which is at the time of recording on general release at the moment as well, which is about Queen Anne. Is there a current trend for revisionist history and what can we make of new interpretations of old histories? Please do be part of the conversation on social media if you've got any thoughts on those or any other points and issues raised. Listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair, and Andrew Scheel. This episode was recorded and edited by Paula Blair, and the music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 and downloaded from ccmixer.org. If you like the show, please support its production with donations to paypal.me forward slash P E A B L A I R or become a member on patreon.com forward slash A V Cultures. From as little as one dollar a month on the pay what you can tier members receive access to exclusive previews extended show notes and video transcripts episodes are released every other wednesday please do rate share and subscribe on your chosen platform as this helps others find the show for more information and to see what any money received goes towards or how else you can be involved visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com follow av cultures on facebook and twitter for updates and links to items relevant to discussions thanks for listening and catch you next time